So Mark chapter 1, um, we are going to, uh, by the grace of God, get through this, uh, this book one chapter at a time. So feel free, I encourage you, if you can, read the chapter ahead of time. It'll make it uh, mean so much more. And of course, if you want to read it afterwards, I often do that after a sermon, I do it again, right? So uh, we already prayed, so let's get started. Um, I'm very excited about studying this book. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll study a chapter each time. Some of the chapters are longer. This is a long chapter, so I'm going to talk very fast uh, to try to get through it. But there's some really cool things in it uh, that I loved finding out. Um, the format will be the same as we did last year, which is a, a time of worship, the teaching, a reflection time, alone with the Lord, and then discussion together, and then prayer. And then if you can stay for lunch, stay. Okay, so this book was written about 50 to 70 A.D., so that's possibly as little as 17 years after the death of Jesus. So it's possibly the first uh, book written, the first gospel written. Um, it's written by John Mark. Obviously, his name is on here. John is the Hebrew name. His Hebrew name, Mark, is the Greek name. And most scholars feel it's really Peter's gospel, Mark wasn't there, of course, um, living with Jesus, walking, traveling with Jesus, but Peter was. So people think that Peter um, told John Mark, and he wrote things down. They were very close, uh, Peter and John Mark. When Peter was released from prison, he probably went and stayed as, at John Mark's mother's home, and Peter calls him my son. So when we think about the Gospels, Dave talks about the Gospels as being, um, often as being, um, people looking at a chandelier from different angles. So there are different themes that the four gospel writers um, get into. They have different styles, of course, all inspired by the Holy Spirit, but written down by one person with a little bit of the personality of the person who was writing it. Um, but we get a better picture of Jesus because we have four different people witnessing to him, whether they're eyewitnesses or Luke, who was so scholarly and interviewed so many people and got it all together scientific really so um, this book the um, was written for Roman Gentile Christians so this would be people that were not Jewish and that were citizens of the powerful Roman Empire which at that time was in control over Israel the focus in this book is the actions of Jesus over the words of Jesus so a lot of the longer sermons are not here but it focuses on the personality of Jesus, what he did, the way he served. He, we see him always busy meeting the needs of people. And some people say it shows us the humanity of Jesus more than any other book. And again, this is probably partially because Peter was um, an eyewitness of all these things, part of the inner circle um, around Jesus and saw him daily during his ministry. This is a book of action. So there are, somebody counted, 40 times in this short book it says immediately. And the most common word here used is and. This happened, and then this, and then that, you know. So it's always, uh. so I love that about this book. The commentator A.T. Robinson says, Mark's gospel throbs with life and bristles with vivid details. We see with Peter's eyes and catch almost the very look and gesture of Jesus as he moved among men in his work of healing men's bodies and saving men's souls. So let's start. The first few uh, verses will go verse by verse, one at a time, and then we'll go chunks of it because it'll be more of a story. Okay, first verse. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So gospel, maybe you know it means good news, but there is this fascinating um, way that this word was used at that time, even in secular Rome. So in the Roman government, um, they used the word here, uh, the word gospel. Um, William Lane, a commentator, says this, among the Romans, the word gospel meant joyful tidings and was associated with the cult of the emperor. So maybe you know the Roman emperors at this time, they were considered gods. And so um, whenever they had a birthday, whenever they um, became of age to rule, 
um, whenever they came into power, they were celebrated with these enormous festivals. And then the news of this festival was sent out everywhere for everyone to, quote, celebrate, and that was called a gospel. So the reports, and I'm going back to quote here, um, the reports of such festivals were called evangels, um, sorry, evangel and gospel are similar, in their inscriptions. A calendar inscription from about 9 BC says of the Emperor Octavian, the birthday of the god was for the world the beginning of joyful tidings which had been proclaimed on this account. So basically it's news that's good for everyone that should go to the whole world. Um, so this inscription that, that he uh, points to is remarkably similar to Mark's initial line, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It, it clarifies the essential content of an evangel to the ancient world, a historical event which introduces a new situation for the world. All right, so Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He says it right out there for everyone to see. First verse. Okay, second verse. As it is written in the prophets, now he goes back in history, explaining uh, more about this wonderful thing that has happened. From Malachi 3.1, um, this quote is, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Before you means ahead of time. Uh, it's not literally in front of someone. Uh, verse 3, another quote from Isaiah 43. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Both of these Old Testament quotes describe a forerunner, someone coming ahead of God's Messiah to prepare Israel to receive him. This is John the Baptist. Um, it says here, he, the voice of one crying out. This is a word crying. It's not literally weeping. It means to call out. And this is also an amazing thing. John MacArthur says about this. John was the divinely promised messenger sent to prepare the way for the Messiah. In ancient times, a king's envoys would travel ahead of him, making sure the roads were safe and fit for him to travel on, as well as announcing his arrival. So, again, a historical detail. It's so cool. Verse 4. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And as I looked up that remission of sins, um, it, you could state it for the dismissal of failings. And I just thought that was just really precious. When we repent, all of our failings, they are sins, but all of our failings are dismissed. It's kind of a, a different way to look at that. Okay, and then it mentions baptizing. That literally means to immerse or overwhelm. This was and still is an outward sign, a washing of a person, and it signifies a person's inter, inner repentance. So it's an outward thing that shows what's happening on the inside. Verse 5. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him, this is John the Baptist, and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. So maybe you know that Jordan is a major river in Palestine. And when it says, all, all went out to him, um, that means a lot of people responded to John's ministry. Verse 6. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So what do we learn about John the Baptist in verses 6 through 8? He had simple clothing. He had simple food. He was not an evangelist that was trying to impress the people with his appearance or with a fancy church or by using smoke machines during worship. I didn't hear about any offerings being taken, but I don't know. Um, he did not seek a comfortable life for himself. He had a mission from God, and he put his all into it. Verse 7 tells us he preached what he knew boldly. He clearly denied that he himself was the Messiah. He was to be the very lowest of servants to the one that was coming after him. In verse 8, John baptizes with water, but he knows that the one coming after him is going to do so much more. 
Jesus baptizes believers with the Holy Spirit with supernatural power, and he still does it today. Regarding that phrase, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. This is something that John is saying about Jesus. Um, David Guzik says, this might sound like a spiritual exaggeration. Oh, I'm not good enough to even untie his sandals. But John said this because in his day, the rabbis, the teachers, taught that their followers, the rabbi's followers, um, should do whatever they asked of them, except to untie their shoes. That was considered a little bit too much. So that is why he picked that phrase. John said he was not worthy to even do that lowly chore. Verse 9, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus was born in Bethlehem fled with his family to Egypt, and then returned to Israel and grew up in the small village of Nazareth. Now, Jesus was baptized not for the repentance of sins, but for the, the beginning of his ministry, to start that new phase of his ministry. In this passage, we see all three members of the Godhead. Jesus is being baptized, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and the Father God speaks audibly to everyone in attendance and commends Jesus. The Trinity of God is a, a huge subject, but we always see them in tandem with one another. They have the same goals, the same methods. They have perfect, beautiful fellowship with one another. So already in this chapter, we hear several testimonials about Jesus' divinity and his mission. In, these, in this very first sentence in the in Evangel, Mark declares that Jesus is the Son of God. Mark quotes two Old Testament prophets who told about the coming of the Messiah, clearly saying Jesus is the Messiah. John the Baptist testified that a holy one is coming after him, who was to be the Messiah. John him, or God himself declares audibly to all that Jesus is his beloved Son, and he is pleased with him. And finally, the Holy Spirit comes down upon him in a visible way. I mean, bang, 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 right? Okay, so we see the heavens parting. That means to split, to rend, to cleave. So I, you know, I was trying to imagine this. Just opening up. I can't do it, but uh, it's a very incredible thought. God the Father calls him his beloved son. That is the word agape, but there's, um, there's some ways that that, um, that means a specially beloved one, like he is a singularly loved one by God. You and I are agape by God as well, but Jesus in a special way, only to him, had that agape relationship with his father. Okay, verse 12. Immediately, the spirit drove him into the wilderness, Jesus, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. So after this glorious public announcement of God the Father, the appearance of the Holy Spirit, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And now it's going to be challenge time, right? To be tempted by Satan. Tempted is to make proof of, to uh, test. Jesus goes into the wilderness by the unction of the Holy Spirit, and now it's time to spend in solitary prayer and to begin his ministry with being victorious over Satan's temptations. Doesn't that make sense? If he's going to accomplish anything else in his life, let's start with this, right? His successful triumph over these temptations is further proof of his power and his dominion over Satan. He was found strong. He was able to withstand all temptation. And this is the kind of savior that we need. This is very important for us. Um, Jesus, just as Jesus chose to be baptized to identify with human beings, um, 
Mark shows us that he identifies with us by being tempted by Satan, our adversary. Matthew and Luke tell us more about these temptations, and remember, he overcame each temptation by quoting the word of God. We must know the word of God. Verse 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I, I see so strongly in this book, there are certain steps that must be done in order. Okay? And here, now John's put into prison. Then Jesus went to Galilee, and he started preaching. He started preaching the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled. Again, fulfilled means to make full, to make complete. So it's like time is filled up, and now this is going to be revealed. Um, he began his public ministry in Galilee, which is north of Jerusalem, and both Jews and Gentiles lived there, each in their own towns. So this is interesting. So Jesus came to call his own, but... There were plenty of Gentiles around that could come hear the word of God. Aren't you glad? Notice that Jesus is preaching about the kingdom of God involved a believing response shown by repentance. So um, Mark sums up what he was saying, what Jesus was saying. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe in the gospel. So if you repent, do the next step. Believe in the gospel. It's one thing to be sorry for your sins, to have regrets. It's another thing then to believe in the gospel, which is that they can be wiped out, that a savior has come to wipe out those sins and to make you right with God. I love that. To repent is to, to change one's mind or purpose. Verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, its brother, who also were in the boats mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. We learn from the first few chapters of the book of John that these men had already met and heard Jesus before they were called. No doubt they had heard his teaching and had seen him heal people before Jesus called them to follow him. David Guzik said these were common men without theological credentials or status in the world. Jesus met them as they labored as, as common men. Jesus chose these disciples not for who they were but for what Jesus could do through them. And I say this about ourselves. Jesus chose you, Jesus chose me, not for what we could do, but what he could do through us. Going on to quote here, Christianity is not about following Jesus, it, sorry, is about following Jesus, not a set of mental exercises or impossible feats of strength or following a set of rules. It is about loving and following and serving a person. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. Jesus offers a journey of transformation of their lives. Only by following Jesus, being with him, in close soul-to-soul -soul living is this possible. It is still true today. And I'm struck even as I read this for now. I will make you fishers of men. That's what I'm going to do through you. But what's the preparation? Walking with me for three years. For seeing me day and night. Hearing all my teachings. Okay, let's not get stuck on what am I called to do? That's important. I, I know in my life that that was like, whew, so important. But what is the preparation? It is knowing Jesus. So let's not skip that step. So these men were casting their nets. This is what they'd done all their lives. This is what they knew. This is what they were doing. It's interesting. Jesus didn't call them when they were in synagogue. He called them when they were doing their work. They were out working. So, um, in a spiritual sense, as we know, this is what they were called later to do. Just cast out the nets of truth and gather in those that would believe. 
As I said, Jesus uses our circumstances and our duties to prepare us for what he's calling us to do. And maybe right now you're being used by the Lord. You have the joy of seeing him work through you, to do something through you. But maybe you are in a preparation stage, and he is shaping and preparing you for work later. Be content to wait for him to use you in a new area of service. Verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So it was common practice for a traveling rabbi or uh, religious teacher in Israel to be invited to speak to everyone as they gathered on the Sabbath. Usually, a sermon really was just quoting from other scholars and their interpretations of the Old Testament scriptures. But when Jesus taught, he taught them with the authority of the creator of the universe. Actually, he was even the word of God himself, right? We learned that from John. He is the word of God, and he's teaching the word of God. It must have been absolutely incredible. Um, so, uh, astonished. Okay, they were astonished at his teaching. We'll, we'll talk about another word later, I guess. Verse 23. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And I asked myself, what's he, what, why, is, why is he in the synagogue? I don't know. I don't have an answer. There was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Again, already in this gospel, Mark, the author, declares several times that Jesus is the Son of God. And now, even demons are well aware of Jesus' true identity, and they declare it out loud. Guzik says, in describing the man who was demon-possessed, Mark used the same grammar Paul uses to describe the Christian's being in Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 1.30. The unclean spirit was the evil lord of this poor man's life. This is a longer quote here. The similarity in the wording between the Christian having Jesus and this man having a demon demonstrates that he is in us and we are in him. We are Jesus-possessed in the right sense because his filling and influence is only for good. Even as Jesus can live in us, so one uninhabited by Jesus can be inhabited by a demon if the invitation is extended, either consciously or unconsciously. Exposure to such things as spiritism, astrology, occult practices, and drugs are dangerous. They open doors to the demonic world that are better left closed. So I will add, if any of these things are in your past and you have not confessed them and renounced them, um, and you'd like someone to help you, I'd be happy to help you. But either way, by yourself, with someone else, please do it. You don't want the devil getting a foothold. And I will add, remember, even anger. We talked about anger on Wednesday night, right? Um, anger, uh, bitterness, also gives the devil a foothold. Verse 25. Okay, we're still in the synagogue with this man with the unclean spirit. Jesus rebuked him, the spirit, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For what authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Sorry, for with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout the region around Galilee. So that word amazed, they were all amazed at him and questioned among themselves. It actually means almost terrified. So that is the bystander's reaction. They are almost terrified. Why did Jesus command the evil spirit to be quiet? I thought he was declaring that he was the son of God. John MacArthur says, Jesus wanted no testimony to the truth from the demonic realm to fuel charges that he was in league with Satan. So later on, some people say, oh, well, he has an evil spirit. 
He's the prince of the Beelzebub. He's, he is doing this because he has an evil spirit. So he doesn't want that um, quoted about him. Uh, Guzik says, Jesus didn't need to rely on hocus pocus or ceremonies when he's talking about delivering this man. He simply demonstrated the authority of God. Jesus said, I'm still quoting, Jesus said, be quiet. Jesus often told demons to shut up. Today, many self-styled deliverers from demon possession encourage the demons to speak or even believe what the demons say. Jesus avoided such theatrics and merely delivered the afflicted man. He's going on to quote also, be quiet and come out of him. He says, there were other exorcists in Jesus' day. He was not the only one who tried to cast out demons, but there was a huge difference between Jesus and other exorcists. They used long, fancy, elaborate, superstitious ceremonies, and they often failed. Jesus never failed to cast out a demon, and in, he never used an elaborate ceremony. Great. Let's remember that in general about church stuff. We don't have to be theatrical. God does it. He doesn't do it. Whatever. It's no big deal. He gets all the glory. Verse 29. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue... They entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. So Jesus works among crowds. All came out to him, right? Um, like he did, and also in the synagogue, but he also worked with individual people. He never sought out crowds just to get more exposure for himself. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. What was her immediate response? She served them. Verse 32. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. So news of Jesus' healings and deliverance for the demon-possessed traveled fast. But people had to wait for the Sabbath to be over because there was a rule that you couldn't carry anything. So you had, if you were carrying someone, um, you had to wait until the sun went down and the Sabbath was over. So when the sun had set on the Sabbath day, Jesus was deluged with sick people. He was up far into the night, healing and casting out demons. He served the sick and demon-possessed people, and he brought joy to many people. He served. And I'm just thinking, too, it says um, the whole city was gathered at the door. He's probably still at the same house. So uh, uh, that's interesting. So healing and casting out demons, he did these things in tandem with his preaching. He healed and delivered people because he loves them and doesn't want them to suffer, but also... Uh, the power to heal is going to give credence to his message, to his power, but it, to his message that it's true because if someone does something supernatural, you sit up and listen, right? So these substantiate who he is and what he has the power to do. Verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go to the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. So Jesus had a busy day uh, at the synagogue. Then he had uh, healing of someone else, the mother-in-law. Then after sun went down, all said all these people came for healing. And then he had a short night because he got up way before morning. Looking ahead to another busy day, Jesus went out to pray alone. Um, and I, I was just reminded of um, Martin Luther, the um, Reformation, um, a pivotal person in the Reformation, uh, which was good. Um, he, he, I remember a quote sometime, he said, I have such a busy day planned I've got to spend three hours in prayer. So that was interesting. We're more like, um, can I just read a Bible verse and get going? Um, so anyway, this is Jesus too. 
lots going on. He wants fellowship with his father. And it's interesting, um, that's what he wants, fellowship with his father. So the disciples, they're new on the job. They had to look for him. They weren't sure. I'm sure by the end, oh, he's probably praying. We can't find him. Uh, They were anxious because so many other people wanted to see Jesus. We are like the disciples. You're popular, Lord. Hurry up. Your fans are asking for you. They want something. Do something. You need to get more and more popular. You know, let's, let's get crazy now. All these people are coming. But he surprises them and busts their ideas. Let's just go to the other small towns around here. Then Jesus drops the bombshell on them. I have come here to preach. I can heal, yes, but the main reason I'm here is to preach the good news of the kingdom. This is my main goal. Jesus was not looking to excite and stir the crowds and gain notoriety through spectacular healings, although he can and does want people healed. I think that's why some people don't get healed. And here's the reason, is because it sometimes brings more glory for God and attention to the kingdom when we are weak and we long for our Savior. Think of Paul. If anyone was worthy uh, of a healing, it would have been Paul. And he's like, well... His grace is sufficient for me. Keeps me dependent. Okay. Jesus' main goal was to preach the gospel. All this stuff was great and it reflects his heart. But that's his goal. Verse 39. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. So he's still healing. He's still casting out demons. So Jesus' strategy was itinerant preaching, roving around the countryside, getting the word out to as many people as possible. And that's just interesting. He could have stayed in one locale and had people come to him. He went out. He went out and found them. And that is great. Because you and I, as his representatives, we can go anywhere. I can, I can go across the street and witness to my neighbor. I can, I, I can go out. I can do things. And I'm, I have my little... People call it circle of influence, and so do you. We're covering it. We're not just just saying, you know, come to this church or come, go to a good church and hear the gospel, any good church. We can go out, just like Jesus went out. Okay, uh, we see that Jesus is doing many, many miracles and healings, and now a particular one is going to be highlighted in this short book. Verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Today, I read there are still 15 million people in the world with leprosy. I had no idea. It is a disease where pieces of flesh slowly rot and then fall off. Certainly in Bible times, no one was ever healed of leprosy unless it was a direct miracle of God. Lepers lived apart from society and depended on loved ones to leave baskets of food for them. They lived out their, quote, life sentence with other lepers, watching their slow and steady disfigurement. Usually rabbis stayed away from lepers since touching one would make you ceremonially unclean. Any person, really. Understandably, most people were repulsed by lepers and wanted them to stay away. So here, this leper is desperate, but notice he approaches. He approaches. He takes a risk, right? He implores Jesus and kneels down before him and speaks to him. We see the leper is sure of Jesus' ability. He says, you can make me clean. He is sure of Jesus' ability to heal his leprosy completely, but he is unsure about his willingness to heal him. So he has faith that Jesus can do it. Also, I think it's interesting, he asked for cleansing, not just healing. You can make me clean. It suggests to me that this leper wants to be right with God. Maybe he knows he had, not only has a physical problem, he knows he has a sin problem. Either way, Jesus is a solution. 41, then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he, Jesus, strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, 
show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So, a very interesting little passage. Compassion, interestingly, this word, apart from the parables, this Greek word is only used for Jesus. Jesus has more compassion than you or me or anyone you've ever met. He has that unique compassion on people. The touch came before the voice. He reached out and connected. Then Jesus, in a few words, addressed the question about his willingness to heal and cleanse and said, I am willing. Notice that although all of creation was, was created by the spoken word, Jesus chose to touch the leper instead of just commanding him to be cleansed. Can you imagine how precious that touch was to the leper? I think it was part of the emotional healing as well. This leper had left his family. He was avoided by everyone and lived in lonely places. Think of what that touch meant to him. Jesus was already perfectly holy and could not become unclean or contaminated by this leper. We know, one reason we know is because he successfully went through the temptations of Satan. He had no sin in him. The instant he touched the leper, the leper did, could not infect him, but rather his perfect holiness and power made the leper healed and cleansed. So the last part of this is very interesting. Jesus warned him, sent him away, don't tell anyone, go do what the law requires. Again, if you or I did that, we'd probably hope they put it in the paper or, you know, somebody had a video of it and it could be played a million times, right? This case, he didn't want that. That strictly warned him phrase means to be moved with anger. Jesus is angry, not angry at him. Angry at the possibility that he's not going to obey what he's saying. To admonish sternly, even to snort. I thought that was so interesting. So before we try to explain that, let's look at the emotions of Jesus in just this one little passage incredible compassion for this man then a stern warning he's he's almost snorting this is why he did not want his ministry limited by the disobedience of this man he was so compassionate to this leper but he needed the man to acknowledge him as lord and obey his stern warning why did he want the leper silence? silent? Chuck Smith said, Jesus did not yet want public acknowledgement or recognition as being the Messiah. He was very conscious of God's timing. The timing was everything. He didn't want it rushed. He wanted a chance to, as we said, go out to all the towns and preach. And he had so much more to say, so much more to teach on, so much more to do. He did not want it short-circuited early. Look how focused he is on his mission. Verse 45, this is what happened. However, he went out, the man, and began to proclaim it freely and spread the matter. We think that this is good, right? Now, in the Great Commission, you can go out and share it freely. But this, this was a timing thing. So that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. So yes, it hindered his ministry. Instead of going into, uh, it says, the city, he had to stay out. And people came to him. He wanted to go to them more. Okay, so it's sad that although Jesus did so much by touching and cleansing him, the leper did not follow Jesus' directions and hindered his ministry. His disobedience meant Jesus was mobbed for healings, making it harder for his message of the kingdom to be heard. Because, you know, you hear a healing and you need one, of course you're going to go. I understand that. While Jesus was willing and able to heal all the diseases, all the heartaches, and possessions by evil spirits, these healings, remember, only provide temporarily relief for people. But teaching about how to be healed from sin and to be healed from rebellion against God, teaching about how to enter heaven and be separated forever from a life and environment of sin, 
That is a more lasting permanent solution. Again, he's come to preach. He heals, he does. But this is why I've come, to preach. His solution about how to get to heaven is eternal, and it is more important, really, than easing the temporary suffering of this life, although it is real. These afflictions and troubles we experience show us we must humble our hearts and look for a savior of our sins and a sustainer who will carry us. He can and does heal today, yet sometimes he chooses out of love to have weaknesses remain so that we long for a greater future. He is glorified in either path as he chooses. Remember, we're jars of clay, and he can shine through us. That's the end of our chapter. Jesus, so compassionate to the hurting, staying up in the night, touching lepers. So strong against temptation. So committed to his mission. So selfless in his serving. So humble to walk among us, to not look for notoriety. And so loving to walk with you and me today, revealing who he is. We're like the disciples. That's why we're called disciples, right? Those disciples got to walk with him, see what he was doing, an inner circle, and it's the same for us. Um, Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this understanding of who you are. Thank you for this good news, the evangel, the gospel, that is that you are the Son of God, that you are the Messiah. And we revere you as such and ask that that totally transform our lives. Help us also love you for all of your lovable attributes, your personality, what you do, what you say, your attitudes, and your strength, Lord. So many things help us meditate on you, Lord. Be exalted in our hearts, in our thoughts, in our words, and help us become also become fishers of men with such a message, such a Savior, uh, such love that we know. Let us share that with others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.